So it's just a little past seven o'clock. I think we'll get underway. Good evening and welcome to our third and final webinar in our Soil Health webinar series. I am Nora Polovich, manager of the North Peace Applied Research Association and joining me as our presenter for tonight's webinar, Gabe Brown. Next slide, please. This series of webinars is being hosted by these nonprofit organizations. All three of us had planned to host Soil Health Academies this summer until the pandemic hit. So we decided to host this series of webinars with the instructors of the academy. So the schools are rescheduled for next summer, July of 2021. So stay posted to our websites and we'll have the information on dates and registration details. So I'll just share a little bit about each of our groups. Lakeland Agriculture Research Association is located in Eastern Alberta, serving the MD of Bonneville, County of St. Paul, Smoky Lake County and Lac La Biche County. Their goal is to conduct applied research, demonstration and extension programs that provide valuable unbiased information to local producers and their vision is to be a leader in applied research and extension in Alberta. And Foothills Forage and Grazing Association, as per on this slide, is also a hosting group, a nonprofit producer driven group addressing issues, ideas and innovations for forage and livestock producers in South Central Alberta. FFGA brings producers together by finding profitable and regenerative ways to produce forages and livestock and they envision a global community that respects and values profitable forage production and healthy soils as their legacy for future generations. And in Para, that is us, we are the third hosting group located up in the peace country of Northern Alberta. We're a nonprofit producer driven group conducting agriculture research and extension serving producers throughout Northern, the North Peace. Our vision is to promote a future in agriculture through improved stewardship. If you'd like more information or to become members of our organizations, please visit our websites. And also a sponsor of tonight's webinar is the Gemstone Cattle Company. Next slide. As mentioned previously, tonight is the final webinar in our series on soil health. All of these webinars are being recorded and they will be available on our websites for your viewing pleasure. Next slide. Our presenter this evening is Gabe Brown, who really doesn't need an introduction, but I'll do a very short one. He is one of the pioneers of the current soil health movement, focusing on the regeneration of our resources. And Gabe, along with his wife Shelley and son Paul, own and operate Brown's Ranch, a diversified 5,000 acre farm and ranch near Bismarck, North Dakota. Their ranch focuses on farming and ranching in nature's image. They believe that healthy soil leads to clean air, clean water, healthy plants, animals, and people. Gabe's presentation will be about an hour long and then we'll have a question and answer period. So please type in your questions into the chat box or the question box. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Gabe. Looking forward to learning about lowering our input costs and rejuvenating soil. Well, thank you, Nora. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this evening. Uh, unfortunately, as Nora noted, uh, with COVID, we weren't able to get up there this summer, but we do have those uh, Academy scheduled for next summer and we eagerly anticipate coming up and, and putting them on. Always a pleasure when we're in Canada. So I'm going to talk uh, this evening about what I think are 10 key ways that producers can lower their input costs while rejuvenating soil. So we often get asked, what is regenerative agriculture and why should I move to regenerative agriculture? And plain and simple, it's our belief that, uh, yes, we want to do it for the right ecological reasons, clean air, clean water, clean, you know, healthy soils. But in order to do any of that, we as farmers and ranchers need to make a profit. And so... Uh, we work with clients all over North America and the way that we get them to move down this path is through profitability. Dr. Jonathan Lundgren, along with his grad student Claire Lacan, did some very detailed analysis on uh, many different farms and ranches in five states and what they found was that 
regenerative farms were actually 78% more profitable as compared to the conventional farms in the study. 78%, that's a, that's a large amount. And we're seeing that. In fact, it's, it's not uncommon for us to work with farms and ranches that literally uh, uh, increase their profitability over 100% after a period of time. So the big question is, where do you start? And this is what tends to be a stumbling block for many individuals is they're confused as, where do I start? What do I start doing? Well, the first thing is you have to start with your attitude. You know, too many people, they have the, what I like to call the woe is me attitude. And, you know, prices are depressed and the weather isn't quite what we want it to be. It's not ideal. And they have a million excuses for not moving down this path. Well, Henry Ford said it best when he said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are correct. And so it's up to each individual to have the correct attitude. And that attitude will determine just how far you're able to take regeneration on your farm or ranch. Regenerative agriculture is a thinking person's game. You know, so often uh, farming and ranching today is done by a recipe card. You know, the agronomist tells us uh, they're going to sell us seed and tell us how much fertilizer to put on and how much, when to spray that crop and, and when we should harvest it. Well, regenerative agriculture is nothing like that. You have to be able to think and observe. And that's something that the observation skills that I think we've lost those in agriculture. Uh, unfortunately, many producers don't have the ability or don't take the time to observe what nature's really trying to tell them. If I see a, a specific weed in my fields, what's that trying to tell me? If I see water ponding on the soil surface, if I see salinity issues, what are those trying to tell me? Well, you have to be able to observe and then to reason and figure out what nature's telling you. So the number one point, we need to understand the principles. And, and I'm sure most all of you are familiar with the six principles. You need to understand your context, your historical ecological context. What was this land like centuries ago? What, what location am I in? What's my weather and patterns? What's my financial context? What's my family context, the family dynamics? Number two, the least amount of mechanical chemical disturbance possible. Now, I'm not saying zero tillage. Yes, we would prefer no till, but I understand that, that there are situations that warrant tillage and those that are farming organically will use tillage uh, for a variety of reasons, but let's minimize those tillage passes. By chemical disturbance, I'm not only talking herbicides and fungicides, we're talking about all forms of fertility. By that, I mean both synthetic and applied. We're working with a number of producers who have confined animal feeding operations, and we're finding that overuse of those applied manures is extremely detrimental to soil health. So we need to limit those. Next one, armor on the soil surface. We need to protect that soil, of course, from wind erosion, water erosion, from evaporation. It's like the skin on an apple. It's like our skin on our bodies. It's there to protect, and we need to protect that soil. We need to add diversity, and by diversity, I don't only mean of plant species. I'm talking of animal species, of insects. We need tremendous biodiversity in order to have a healthy functioning ecosystem. We need living roots in the soil as long as possible throughout the year. Yes, in your northern environment and mine, uh, plants will shut down, but perennials will still keep pumping root exudates into the soil throughout the winter. We need that as long as possible throughout the year. And we need livestock and animal integration. That is critical to a healthy 
soil ecosystem. Point number two, we need to understand the power of sunlight, plants, and the soil. It's an energy flow. You know, plants take in sun through photosynthesis. They create all these compounds and pump them into the soil. Ray Archuleta said it best when he said plant and soil are one. We as farmers and ranchers need to understand this energy flow and the importance of harnessing that sunlight through photosynthesis and pumping those compounds into the soil. The greatest geological force on earth is life itself. And we need to understand how to work with that life. This is a picture of Ray and I in Mexico and we're actually standing on solid rock. But look at those grass plants growing out of that rock. So how does that happen? Is there a pocket of soil in that rock? No. What happens is a seed landed on that rock, it was wet long enough to germinate, photosynthesis started occurring, and that little seedling then pumped these compounds into this, onto that rock. They combine with water, form a mild form of carbonic acid, and start breaking down that parent material. That's how soil is formed, through that simple act of a living plant. I'm going to show you a series of slides here that I took. Uh, I took these photos last summer down in New Mexico, and we were working on a very large ranch down there, nearly a million acres in size. And they had us come because they wanted to figure out how they could increase productivity. Well, believe it or not, this was actually one of the better areas of the ranch. And if you look closely, you see just how much bare soil there is there. And the ranch foreman was telling me that, well, Gabe, you know, there's only so much production we can get with this poor soil. And he proceeded to take a spade and dig it in the soil and it was just white. And so what I did, if you can see my cursor here, he had dug here. In, in that bare spot, and it was just this white soil, and he said, that's the soil we have. Well, I simply stepped a couple steps away where there was some grass plants, and I dug down, and I dug this soil up. Now, I moved them close together. Look at that, that's the exact same soil type. The only difference is living plant, no living plant. It's energy flow. Plants take in sunshine, through photosynthesis, they create these compounds, pump them into the soil, and that feeds soil life, and you have this transformation. Now, I show you these photos because I don't care if we're in New Mexico or in Alberta, the same thing is taking place. And it's our responsibility as farmers and ranchers to harvest that solar energy and feed soil life in order to build healthy soil. Third point is proper soil testing. Most soil tests, in fact, 95 plus percent of the soil tests taken today, I'm just gonna come right out and say it, are basically meaningless. They only, they're only a snapshot of the inorganic fraction of nutrients that are available the day the sample was taken. Now those inorganic fractions, inorganic means they're not tied to a carbon molecule, so they're readily available to the plant. Well, the agronomist then is gonna make recommendations based on that snapshot of inorganic nutrients. But I'll ask you this, when do you take your soil test? Is that when your plants are growing? And then, is that the only nutrients that'll be available to those plants throughout the growing season? Of course not. These agronomists are missing the mark. They've been missing, for instance, half of the nitrogen. There's an organic pool of nitrogen and depending on how healthy your soil is, that may be very, very large. If we go out and test the organic nitrogen in pastures, it's a very large pool, but the agronomist will take you and show you a soil sample of your pasture and it'll be a very small amount of inorganic in. And they'll be telling you, 
oh, you need to fertilize your hay field. You need to fertilize this pasture. You need to fertilize this cropland. But they're missing over half of the pool that's available. We know that in healthy soil, soil that has a healthy population of mycorrhizal fungi, that fungi is able to transfer amino acids and the nitrogen contained therein into the plant. So plants can take up organic forms of nitrogen. Now your agronomist needs to be telling you that and you need to be insisting on having the proper soil tests taken that show both the organic and inorganic fractions of these nutrients. Right now, our business Understanding Ag is consulting on over 17 million acres across North America. And we're able to increase profitability uh, for most of our clients the first very first year. And the way we do that, we're not geniuses, we simply do proper soil testing and then apply nutrients if necessary in the appropriate amounts. But you have to understand these soil tests, how to take them and how to read them in order to make those recommendations. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, some work that we're doing with General Mills. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, Understanding Ag was hired by General Mills to work with a large number of producers in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and North Dakota. And what we did there as part of our baseline on these farms and ranches is uh, we performed what's called total nutrient extraction. And think of total nutrient extraction as the soil's bank account. So we looked at how much total, both organic and inorganic nutrients was in the soil. We measured it to 12, we took soil samples down to 12 inches in depth. So on the left there, that's all of the nutrients we tested for. The majors, of course, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, but then we tested for a number of micronutrients also. Here's what we found on these 45 farms. The average nit um, pounds of nitrogen per acre in the top 12 inches of the soil profile was 9,000 pounds. Of the 45 farms we tested, the lowest amount was 1,000 pounds. That means even the poorest soil on any of those 45 farms still had 1,000 pounds of nitrogen on it. Yet, how many of the agronomists that those farmers were working on told them that? How many told them that they had plenty of nitrogen? The highest farm, I believe, is 14,500 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, surprisingly, across the 45 farms, they were fairly consistent. Phosphorus, 2,300 pounds per acre on the average. Every farm we tested for was sufficient in phosphorus. Potassium, 11,000 pounds per acre, average potassium on those farms. Look at the micronutrients here. You know, agronomists are often saying, oh, we need to add sulfur, we need to add calcium. Really? 40,000 pounds of calcium. Look at iron, 60,000 pounds per acre on the average. And realize this is just in the top 12 inches of the soil profile. So what's the total of value of that? And I apologize, I'd, I'm not familiar with what uh, your nutrient costs are there in Alberta, but you can plug in your own uh, numbers from your local agronomy center. What's that worth? 9,000 pounds of nitrogen, 2,300 of phosphorus, potassium, all these micronutrients. What's that worth? huge dollar amount. Now think of it this way, and I'll ask you this question. How deep do the roots go on whatever crop you have on that particular field or in that particular pasture? You know, chances are, even if it's an annual small grain crop, we're going down three to four feet with some of those very fine roots. About eight feet, 10 feet. How much nutrients do you suppose are in that then? Okay. 
So there was absolutely no deficiencies on any of the 45 farms. Now we're taking this a step further. We're now testing uh, farms in a large number of farms in Kansas. We've expanded the project in Canada a bit. So we're testing more farms there. And I guarantee you, we're not going to find any deficiencies. So what's going on? You know, why aren't we seeing then these crops being healthy and thriving from all these nutrients? Well, the answer, of course, is we're not short on nutrients. We're short on biology because it's the biology that transfers these nutrients, makes them available to the plants. We need to focus on biology, which brings me to point number four. We need to understand how soil functions. And I am blessed every day that I get to learn from some of the brightest people on this planet. And there's not a day goes by that we're not learning more as to how soil functions. Biology is your silent partner. It is the interaction of life. You know, we need to focus on that. So many times farmers and ranchers, they just think of soil as dirt. They don't realize that we're standing on top of a whole nother world. You know, there's more microorganisms in a teaspoonful of healthy soil than there are people on this planet. Yet how many of us as farmers and ranchers spend our time thinking about how do we feed our silent partner? Am I providing the home and habitat that that biology needs in order to make my farm or ranch more profitable? Plants rely on microbes for nutrients, for protection from pathogens, and for gene regulation. Biology drives the system. And we need to understand that as farmers and ranchers. We're so focused on that plant, that particular plant, whether it be a cash crop of canola or, or, or wheat, or if it's a forage crop or a grass crop to be grazed by livestock, we're so focused on that plant, we really need to be focusing on the biology. And the biology then will ensure that we have a healthy crop, a healthy pasture, a healthy forage, which in turn will equate to healthy livestock and more dollars in our pocket. This is the rhizophagy cycle. So that in the center there, it depicts a root tip. Dr. James White at Rutgers University discovered that microbes actually enter in through the tip of the root. And when they do, after they get inside, they become uh, wallless protoplasts. And then the plant is able to extract nutrients from the biology. So this is how critical biology is. We think that if we add a synthetic fertilizer or if we add manure, that's what's feeding the plant. No, it's feeding the biology. The biology is entering into the plant. The plant then extracts those nutrients from those microbes. And then what happens, that plant then expels those microbes back out through the root hairs. And this next photo shows that. This is the root hair of a plant. And this cloud, so to speak, around is biology being expelled by that plant back out into the soil to go collect more nutrients. W what a beautiful cycle. Now, besides this, Dr. White has discovered that during the reproductive phase of a plant, that plant is, to, is able to move those wallless protoplasts up through the plant onto the seed. And then when that seed from that plant is either dropped or take carried away by a bird or, or we harvest the grain, that biology is already on that seed, ready to propagate and start the cycle over again. I don't know about you, but I find that absolutely mind blowing. It makes perfect sense 
when you think of how these plants evolved over time in harmony with nature. Now, what do we do in our infinite wisdom as human? Oh, let's go put seed coating and seed treatment on that seed, right? Aren't we killing the very microorganisms that that plant, that seedling would rely on for its health? You wanna make money in agriculture, pay attention to things like this. That's why our group, Understanding Ag, is such big proponents of keeping your own seed back, using your own seed from your own farm. It's already inoculated with the biology that it needs. It's the little things like this that'll make you a pile of money. So how do we get more biology on our farm? The answer is point number five. We need diverse living plants. This is a photo of one of my native paddocks. Look at the diversity in that paddock. If you can imagine back, what did Alberta look like 500 years ago? It was, uh, it was a vast grassland, savanna type grassland. There was lots of ruminants grazing on it, bison, elk, deer being moved by predators. And that whole system created a very, very diverse ecosystem of living plants. Think of what's going on though under the soil of this particular paddock. Think about all the different root depths, root shapes, root sizes, how much biology is being fed. I told you about total nutrient extraction. How deep are those going? You know, uh, there, there's plenty of research out there that shows many of these uh, uh, quote unquote native species went down 10, 12, 15 feet into the soil profile. You know, think of the amount of nutrients and we wonder why that was such productive grasslands. And now you look at what we have today. You know, we have very unproductive soils for the most part. They're being propped up by synthetics. How? By us writing checks constantly. We need to get away from that. We need to start focusing on that sunlight plant soil connection. This is some work by Dr. David Tillman University of Minnesota, and Dr. Tillman uh, did some very good work. On the left axis is plant biomass. On the bottom axis is species diversity. I often get asked, well, how many species do I need in a mix? Well, there's no right or wrong answer, but look what happens once we get to this eight or 10 species in here, seven to 10 species. Look at the amount of extra, of extra plant biomass that we're gonna get just by having diversity. Now think of what we do in agriculture today. We plant monoculture cash crops. We plant hayland fields of strictly alfalfa or monoculture hay. Even our pastures are not very diverse. We need the diversity as Dr. Tillman shows to take advantage of those synergies. Same thing with functional diversity. Plant biomass on the left, Functional diversity, in other words, grasses, forbs, legumes, shrubs, trees, the more functional diversity we have, the more we're gonna increase plant biomass. And then you combine the two together and think of the compounding effect that has. Tremendous. This is how to put more money in your pocket. Take advantage of these synergies of nature. I'm gonna show you some data from Green Acres Farm. Uh, this is some really compelling data. They planted an 18-way warm season grazing mix. Now, yes, I know that both you and I are in cool season environments, but we still do have a small warm season component. Uh, don't pay so much attention to that as to pay attention to what happens here over the course of a season. They measured 21 tons of biomass on this. Average daily gain on their livestock was four pounds. So here's that warm season 18 species blend being grazed by livestock. Another photo, ungrazed and grazed. They're putting a tremendous amount of carbon. Think of what's happening there. Think of the positive compounding effects. We're harvesting a tremendous amount of sunlight. We're pumping tremendous, amount of car carbon and other compounds 
into the soil to feed biology. That biology is being stimulated and bringing all these nutrients into those forages. So they took this Haney soil test prior to seeding this mix. And then they also ran a test post grazing. They increased organic matter 0.2%, which is really good for one grazing season. But look at what happened to nitrogen, pounds of nitrogen per acre. They added 66 pounds of nitrogen per acre just from grazing the one cover crop. They added 63 pounds of phosphorus. Now, I don't want you to think this magically appeared. What I mean to be saying here is this is the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that became available because of the biology. It's always in the soil. I showed you through the total nutrient extraction tests on those 45 farms that we have plenty of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but it's not being made available. This demonstration here showed that by planting a diverse cover crop, by grazing it properly with livestock, we're able to make those nutrients available. Look at that. $113 more per acre worth of nutrients that are available to the next year's cash crops due to this integration of cover crops and livestock. That's profit, folks. That's profit. It all goes back to the carbon cycle. You know, we got to have sunlight, we got to have living plants, we got to pump that energy into the soil to feed biology and strategically grazing livestock to trample that forage so it's armor on the soil surface and to feed biology is critical. Cash crops alone will not cycle enough energy to drive a healthy system. I can't tell you the number of phone calls I get. It's a daily basis. Hey, what do, how do I need to diversify my cash crop rotation in order to move down the regenerative path? You're not going to do it. We're going to make small, minor steps. We must integrate cover crops into the cash crop rotation, plain and simple. This is a photo of my place where following an old harvest, I seeded a diverse cover crop mix on August 15th. Now, uh, this was taken uh, several years ago. But my point here is, yes, I'm collecting sunlight. Yes, I'm providing armor, I'm still doing some good, but there's no way I will cycle enough energy from this cover crop to fuel the next year's cash crop without adding inputs, okay? I'm in no way saying don't do this. I always encourage you to be growing something, but don't think it's gonna be the salvation. We have to simply integrate full season cover crops into the crop rotation and preferably graze them with livestock. I know there's a lot of cash grain farmers out there who don't like to hear that. They don't want livestock on their land. And I will tell them, well, that's your decision, but you will never advance soil health to the point that I'm able to when I integrate livestock. That's plain, simple truth. So this is a photo from a couple years ago on my ranch. Uh, that is an 1150 pound finished animal right there. The thing about this is this is actually the second cover crop I grew on this particular field. We grew a rye, winter wheat, winter triticale, hairy vetch crop that we grazed by livestock. We then seeded this diverse, uh, it was 11 species warm season mix on there we received two and a half inches of rainfall. And that's the amount of biomass I was able to produce. Now imagine what that's doing for the biology in the soil. Look at the armor I'm putting down and I'll talk more about that coming up. And I will show you here, whoops. This is what the soil looked like when I was done. We're building soil aggregates. We're providing that pore space for water infiltration the home for a biology. Look at how deep I'm gonna be able to, 
to how easily the roots can go down in the soil and how deep down I'm going to be able to transfer nutrients from. Here is what those livestock did. There was 35 acres in that particular field. We turned the livestock in on September 7th. We finished grazing October 10th. We shipped those animals directly off that cover crop to the kill plant. They averaged 1,176 pounds live weight. We averaged 4.05 pounds average daily gain while they were on that mix. That compares favorably to any feedlot at a much, much lower cost than we can do it in a feedlot. So here's the economics from that, 107 finishers. Uh, we valued them at $1.10 per pound to gain. So you take out the cost of seed and seeding. I've got half the land cost in there because uh, we had grown a previous cover crop and grazed it. There's my seeding cost, my labor. So net profit per acre, $348. That's very profitable. And uh, those cattle graded choice coming off that cover crop. Once, I'll go back a couple slides here, that cover crop, because it's a warm season mix, it's terminated by frost. So the next spring, this is what it looks like. And this is my point number six, covers for weed control. People wonder how I use so little chemical on our ranch. On our 5,000 acre ranch last year, my total chemical bill was $19.95. And it was simply because I had a little spot of some weeds along a major highway that I wasn't able to get livestock to. And so I bought a jug of chemical just to spray them uh, to appease the highway department. Other than that, we had zero chemical use. Here's what it looks like prior. This is actually seeded. If you look closely, you can see where my planter had gone through and seeded into that. How many weeds are gonna germinate through that? How much wind erosion am I gonna be susceptible to? Water erosion. Am I gonna keep soil temperatures optimum? Of course, but that's the key. We have to have that armor. And that of course is one of the six principles of a healthy soil ecosystem. Here I am planting through that. You notice no trash whippers, I do not want any bare soil to be seen. This is where I had a cover crop on the right hand side the previous fall. On the left hand side, I did not get a cover crop seeded. This is the following spring. Look at the difference there. On the right hand side, I will be able to plant the cash crop and not use any herbicide that growing season. Yet look at what's gonna happen on the left hand side. Obviously you're gonna have to use a herbicide there. This is on Marlin Richter's here in Burley County. The previous year, this was peas for grain on both sides of that tree row. On the left side, they grew a very diverse cover crop mix after the pea crop and grazed it with livestock. On the right hand side, they sprayed that the previous fall and this is the next spring. So they have multiple chemical passes plus they lost the opportunity to feed biology, cycle that solar energy, feed livestock. On one side, you have win, 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 money, money, money being made. On the other side, you have lost, 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 expense, expense, expense. This is not rocket science. This is simply following the principles of nature. Point number seven, understand carbon nitrogen ratios. So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of understanding these ratios. If you look the third line down, that's soil organic matter, mollusol soils, 11 to 1, 11 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. In agriculture, we can never decouple nitrogen and carbon. They go hand in hand. Now we talk about biology. Look at bacteria five parts carbon, one part nitrogen, okay? Look at protozoa, 30 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. So the start of the nitrogen cycle, you have a protozoa. That protozoa consumes bacteria, 
it needs 30 parts carbon. So in other words, it's gonna have to eat six bacteria to get that 30 parts of carbon. But if it eats six bacteria, how many nitrogen does it have? Six, of course, it only needs one. So the other five it excretes out, that's the start of the nitrogen cycle. That's what's available to your plants. Now we need to understand the importance of that and how we feed this biology. So the next photo, I have a very lush growing, newly seeded cover crop here. It's about 20 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. In the background there, I have a more mature forage crop. That happens to be sorghum sedangrass. It's about 60 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. So if we go back to our chart, you know, I've got a very lush growing crop here, that's gonna break down very, very quickly. On the other side of the photo, I had a very mature crop, higher in carbon, that's gonna break down much, much slower. Now, why is that important? If I go back to my heavy residue, that's gonna take a long time to break down. Also then, it's gonna take a long time to release nutrients. So as a farmer, I need to ask myself, okay, what, cover, what crop am I planning to have in that particular field next year? Is it a crop like barley that needs its nutrients real early in the growing season? Or is it a crop like corn, or soybeans then and needs its nutrients later in the growing season. That'll determine what type of cover crop I have and how mature I let it get. We could also wait and have a very mature cover crop, roll it down, in this case, this was cereal uh, rye that they planted corn into. That residue will remain a long time to protect that soil but realize it's also gonna be a slower release of nutrients. We have to understand carbon nitrogen ratios. Way too often I get working with producers and they say, oh, I gotta go till the soil, I have a residue problem. You don't have a residue problem, you have a carbon nitrogen imbalance. You have too much carbon in the system, not enough nitrogen. Plant some legumes, we can easily correct that. We gotta think our way through that. The eighth point, move livestock frequently. As a general rule, the more often you move your animals, the greater the compounding positive response to soil health. That is if you allow adequate recovery times. This is one thing that's very hard for most producers to realize. But let me show you this photo, and this is actually some Canadian soil taken in Manitoba. This was a field of cover crops where the producer split the field. On part of it, he did multiple daily moves of the livestock. On the other part, he moved every two days. Folks, that's the same soil from one season of grazing difference. Do you think this sold him on how often and frequently he should be moving his livestock? Now this doesn't even take into consideration the increased average daily gain and herd health benefits you get to the livestock by doing multiple daily moves. I mean, that's just mind blowing right there. Look at that. And th they were able to do it simply from moving livestock more frequently. Okay, if that doesn't give you the enough ambition to go move some livestock, I don't know what will. Point number nine, recognize the detrimental effects of hand. Now, I'm in a northern environment. You're a lot further north than I am. So I understand that you're going to have to have some processed forage in most cases to get through the winter. But the thing of it is we really need to be feeding that forage on the field where it was taken from. So this is on my ranch. 
Uh, what we do is we hay a particular field only once out of a, approximately every four to five years. And then we feed that hay on the field where we uh, put it up from. This is the following spring. That's what that looked like. And I often hear people, oh my goodness, you can't have that. That's awful. You got to go out there and harrow it and burn it. And no, Gabe's way too lazy and too cheap to do any of that. All you need to do is let it go. This is that same paddock later in the season. Look at the production we're getting. You see in the foreground, there's the remnants of one of those, that bale residue. That'll cycle through after a few years. That's just carbon feeding biology. Don't worry about it. Now, right next to it's a paddock where we did not bale graze. Look at the difference in production there. Our local soil district came out and clipped those areas. Look at that, we over tripled above ground biomass where we bale grazed. We increased crude protein. TDN was about equal. We don't need to buy more acres of land, rent more land. We just make, need to make better use of the land we have. It's all about cycling carbon. The other thing we're able to do by bale grazing is we're stimulating new seedlings. And we're, we notice that oftentimes we will put up uh, hay that is, uh, consists of native species. Most of the um, paddocks now that we are haying and bale grazing on, there's well over 20 different species in those paddocks. So we have the diversity that's necessary and we're able to stimulate and increase this species diversity, because I showed you the importance of that with the work that Dr. Tillman has done. And we're seeing other natives get established. You see in the center of the photo, that's where a bale set, and we're able to get other species established. Point number 10, my final point is to be intentional. So that's my house there and that's our front yard and i believe in practicing what i preach my in-laws when they had this farm they had a monoculture lawn of crested wheatgrass i tell the story that my wife just despises mowing lawn so every year she'd go out and she'd mow that lawn as short as she could so it would turn brown she wouldn't water it and then she wouldn't have to mow it again uh, quite a few years ago, I said, no, we can't have this. We preach about the importance of soil health and diversity. So I pulled the lawnmower keys from her and I would not allow her to mow it anymore. Now here's what we do. You notice the poly wire in front. We move our cattle onto our lawn for a brief several hour period, once or twice a year. And yes, there is a poly wire right in front of the house there, so they can't rub on the house. I can get away with a lot, but I can't get away with that. And here's what it looks like a few hours later. The lawn is mowed, it is fertilized, and we have now counted over 30 different species of grasses, forbs, and legumes in the lawn. And that all come about just from the latent seed bank and just grazing it with livestock. That is how intentional I felt I needed to be in focusing on soil health and land regeneration. Here's what it's about. If you have more carbon entering the soil than leaving, your children will likely farm your land. If you have more carbon leaving your farm than entering, they likely won't. Farming and ranching are extraction businesses. Regenerating our soils will allow us to farm and ranch forever. Remember that your farm, your ranch, is a direct reflection of you. If you don't like the way it is, you need to look in a mirror and you need to become intentional and make the changes necessary to move your farm, your ranch, in the direction you want it to go. 
With that, I want to invite you. I understand that the border's closed, so you wouldn't be able to come down to the Soil Health Academies. But on the right, Understanding Ag has a webinar coming up on September 15th featuring our consultant Alejandro Carrillo. That is a picture on the left there of Alejandro's neighbor's ranch. And on the right is Alejandro's ranch. He is truly turning the desert into an oasis. I've been down in, into the, onto his ranch, seen it for myself. It is absolutely mind blowing what he's able to do on six to eight inches of moisture. And so we encourage you to uh, tune into that webinar. I want to thank the associations for inviting me to present this evening. Uh, I truly enjoy working with, I've, I've had the great opportunity to work with all these associations and coming up to Alberta, Canada is one of the very, my very favorite places in the world. With that, I'll turn it back to Nora. Thanks, Gabe, for an awesome presentation as usual. We do have some questions. Our first one is from Rob. Thank you for the great information. What are you using to replace glyphosate on your operation? Yep, and I showed that. I am replacing glyphosate with those cover crops. And not only that, I mean, those cover crops are that soil armor that is inhibiting weeds. Uh, the weeds from germinating. The other thing though that uh, I haven't mentioned in here but needs to be mentioned is when you get a healthy functioning ecosystem you're going to have a tremendous number of granivores. Granivores are insects that consume seeds and uh, earthworms for example will do a tremendous job of consuming seeds. And there was work by Dr. Randy Anderson. He's now retired, but if you Google Dr. Randy Anderson, uh, ARS South Dakota, he did some really good work on the importance of granivores in a system and how many weed seeds they, they eat. So I'm one, I'm not gonna tell people that I will never use glyphosate, but in saying that it, it's been a long time since I have. And realize it's partially a mindset also. If you think you're gonna have these pristine, quote unquote, weed-free fields moving down this system, no, it's not gonna happen. We have to start thinking in terms of profit instead of yield. There's a big difference between the two. So uh, some of it is just tolerance. You gotta tolerate more and you need to understand that a few weeds here and there are not gonna be the demise of a cash crop. Next question is from William. Do you believe regenerative agriculture can feed the population we have today and how? Okay, William, I love that question because it's one I often get asked. And here's what I tell people. Okay, if you compare my ranch to those in the area, county average. My proven yields are on average over 25% up to 100% higher than county average. So I'm producing more grain, plus we produce beef and poultry and lamb and pigs and honey and vegetables and all these other crops on the same acreage. My neighbors who are maximum input a driven system, have a maximum input driven system, produce slightly higher yields than I do, but they're producing one monoculture. I'm not only producing cash crops, I'm producing all of these other edible products also. So I'm gonna feed the world far, far quicker and with food truly higher in nutrient density as compared to the conventional model. And we're seeing that. Understanding Ag is working on several projects right now where we're actually quantifying the nutrient densities of the products that are being produced along with the profitability. And as I showed you in Dr. Lundgren's uh, work, it's significantly higher profitability 
on the regenerative farms. So can we do it? Yes, we are doing it very, very easily. The, the challenge I would put out is how are we going to feed the world under the current model? That's the challenge that I would put out. From Ben. Hi, Gabe. Great presentation. To rebuild bare and depleted soils and keeping in mind a budget limit, would you recommend sowing a few fast growing annuals with companions at a higher rate per hectare or concentrate on sowing a lot of diversity to the range of 20 to 30 perennial and annual species, but at a lower seeding rate per hectare due to, due to the cost factor? Wow, Ben, that, that's a great question. And the way I would answer that is, think of it this way, when the municipality builds a road, what's the first thing that comes along the side of that road, right? It's your annual forbs. So many call them weeds. That's the first thing that comes. Then it's annual grasses, and then it'll transition to perennials. So to answer your question, I would seed the low cost. I would even let weeds germinate, quote unquote weeds, seed low cost annual grasses into it at a lower rate because you have to protect the soil, you have to feed biology. It can get very expensive seeding these 30, 20 and 30 species mixes. Don't do that. Keep your costs, seed costs low and just think of it as I got to I got to pull in sunlight. So what can I put there that will capture the most solar energy? Let the weeds come to some degree. Seed a, a low cost annual crop. I would make sure it's a grass, though, such as oats or barley, something like that. Whatever seed you can find and start that way. I would much rather do that than seed an expensive mix. From Jerry, what is the value of livestock integration in winter versus summer? Oh, Jerry, great question. Uh, they both have benefits. The biggest benefit during the summer is there's some, think of it this way, we've all watched a cow rope the grass. She ropes the grass with her tongue and then actually tugs on it and tears it off. There's research that's been done that shows that plants evolve, that that's a signal to the plant. When they are bitten, they will then, it, that tugging action is a signal to them to send more root exudates out into the soil in order to attract biology to cycle nutrients to regrow. So because of that act during the growing season, you will get a greater, more beneficial response to the soil biology and to soil health. Now, in saying that, it's still a benefit to graze during the winter. Just, it, it's not gonna be as great a benefit and, and as quick a benefit as if you graze during the growing season. From Aaron, when do you plant the warm season mixes and when do you start to graze them? Yes, and, and Aaron, that, that all depends on resource concerns. Now, I know I showed some pictures of, of warm season mixes, and I don't want Nora and her crew up at Manning to think they can plant and get 12-foot high sorghum sedan grass. It's not going to happen in Manning, right, Nora? <laughs> so, so realize there is a small component of warm seasons in Alberta. So use them if they're appropriate to your situation. What's more important is to just grow biomass. And so I plant the warm season mixes anywhere from the 10th of June on to the 15th of July. If I don't get them in by the 15th of July, you know, there's not enough time for them to grow a lot. Our average uh, first killing frost is about the 10th of September. So we're not a whole lot different than Nora is up there, really. And so you have to take that into consideration. Now, we do get a bit, bit hotter during the summer, and that's why we can, we can grow our warm seasons uh, to a greater extent. But anywhere in the June and early July timeframe is when I, I seed them. 
and then I will graze them whenever I think it's appropriate. Uh, we may have grass finishers going on them in early July, mid-July. We may keep those and not graze them till December or January, graze them with cow-calf pears in the winter. All depends on what we wanna do with them. Now, William says he recently watched the Kiss the Ground movie trailer coming out on coming out on September 22nd and saw you and others from the Soil Health Academy in it. Very cool. What do you think about it? And can you give us any spoilers? Oh, so that was actually filmed seven years ago. And it took this long to get it all edited and released. I will say this much. Um, and I was just interviewed the other day as a part of it. And, and they asked me why I took part in it. And when uh, Josh Tickell, Josh and Rebecca Tickell, the producers of it first contacted Ray and I, um, they were wanted to go down the path of the benefits of organic. And Ray and I decided that, you know, it needs to be bigger than that. We need to talk about soil health and the importance of soil in everything we do, whether, whether it's everything from farm profitability to air quality, water quality, and human nutrition. And so uh, Ray and I agreed to take part in it. And I will tell you, uh, even though they had a lot of influence from people who wanted to uh, downplay the importance of livestock and grazing animals on the land, the film does a pretty good job in showing just how critical it is for us to take care of the soil. So thank you for those comments. Uh, that um, just came out, that trailer, and it's approaching 3 million views already. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Kim says, great presentation, Gabe. We are fortunate to ranch in two hemispheres when we could travel. A small ranch in West Central Alberta and another in the southwest corner of Victoria, Australia. There is a lot of interest, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of interest down here in stimulating the soil biology with compost teas and extracts, as our soil biology here is much slower to improve compared to our Alberta operation. Besides cover cropping, how can we speed up the formation of a strong, healthy, resilient soil biome? Oh, that's a great question. And I've had the good fortune of of spending quite a bit of time in Victoria, Australia, and I really enjoy it. Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, without a doubt, the best way is to stimulate it with grazing livestock. That action of grazing animals and the hoof action, the dung, the urine, the grazing component of it, that interaction of biology from the animals themselves to the soil is the number one way to jumpstart that. I would look, if you're going to do some compost, compost teas, I would look at the Johnson Sioux method of producing um, compost and, and getting the right biological component. We're seeing excellent results using the Johnson Sioux method. Next question is, how would in, how would you increase low pH soil without expensive lime input? Yep, get asked this question all the time and we have yet to have a client where we've had to add lime and we've had very, very low pHs. It, we have the data that shows it's diversity that's going to moderate those pHs and bring them back to where they need to be. And we have been able to do that over time. Uh, we are not at all believers in adding lime. You can do it with diversity. Rylan asks, I want to increase calcium levels in my orchard tree leaves and fruit. How can I do that in a reasonable amount of time? Mm -hmm. And we work with a number of orchards, same principle. Uh, we've gone into these orchard and seeded very, very diverse mixes between the rows. And what we're seeing is the same thing with pH. We're able to make those nutrients available. I would recommend a total nutrient extraction test to see where you're at because chances are 
you have plenty of calcium in the soil. We're just, we just do not have the mycorrhizal fungi and the biology to move that into the trees themselves. Shayla says, we are in Saskatchewan. We are wanting to rejuvenate pastures. What do you recommend to start? Should we be spraying the pasture out or direct seeding in? Should we be using annuals for a couple years then back to perennials? We have a no-till drill. Okay. Um, thanks for the information. I still would want to know more before I would really give you any advice. It's rare that we recommend spraying out and starting over. Um, normally, what we recommend is proper grazing management. Allow biomass to grow and then uh, go in there with high stock densities where we're getting uh, really good armor down on the soil surface. We're getting the dung and the urine down and that is stimulating, uh, in most cases, a latent seed bank. Now, um, as a matter of fact, I am working with Applied Ecological Services, and they are close to being able to do a soil probe and then take that soil and quantify the latent seed bank in it. And we'll be able to use that data to determine if you have a latent seed bank or if we have to go in and uh, seed something. But our first choice always is to try and do it with uh, proper livestock grazing. Okay, you had answered a question that Kim had, uh, who had the two different properties in two different hemispheres. And he just says, we've got a Johnson Sioux bioreactor bio going. Thanks for your comment. Uh, Question again from Rob, are you seeding green and what are your thoughts on it? Seeding green, uh, we recommend to our clients to, to seed green whenever possible if their production parameters allow it. Now, obviously I do not like to use glyphosate, so I am not seeding green. I am using the previous year's winter killed cover crop as my uh, cover. Um, most producers we work with though do use herbicides and then they prefer to seed green because we're seeing better plant stands, better seed soil contact, seeding green as opposed to terminating it first and then seeding. Uh, we really like seeding green and then going in and doing termination. William says, I've enjoyed listening to you talk this evening. Great job on the presentation. Just curious, what type of equipment did you do away with when you began regenerative farming in the 90s? Mm -hmm. And what equipment do you use now that is critical to regenerative ag practices? Wow, great question, William. Thank you for asking it. So what I did away with was every piece of tillage equipment I had, I sold all of it in order to be able to afford my first no-till drill. And that way I was never tempted to, to go back. But in saying that, um, I had to do it because I didn't have, wouldn't have had enough money to buy the drill. That no-till drill is critical for my cropping operation. Um, I would say what's more critical on our operation though is the livestock. The diverse species and the numbers of livestock we have, uh, they just allow us to regenerate about any soils. And I always tell the story, uh, my good friend, Neil Dennis, may rest in peace. I'll never forget the first time I went up to Neil's after I'd met him to see what he was doing there by Wawota, Saskatchewan. And I saw what he was doing on perennial grazing land and it just made sense to me because I'd already been, I wasn't near as high stock density as Neil, but I was doing rotational grazing at the time and fairly high stock density. Uh, I was running 250, 300,000 pounds. I wasn't at the million Neil was, but I'll never forget driving back home and I just drove across the international border and it just hit me and I went, Gabe, you idiot. That is what you have to do on cropland. 
I have to get high stock density grazing on cropland to take my cropland soils to the point these perennial soils are at. And when I got back home, we seeded cover crops to graze on cropland. And when I started doing it, it was like night and day difference. And that's why in this presentation tonight, I made the point of telling and sharing with you that you, you have to get full season covers growing on cropland and then preferably graze them uh, when and where you can. It'll just make that big a difference to your cropland. Next question, how late in the season can you seed cereal rye for winter survival? Uh, for winter survival, the latest I've seeded it is October 11th and it did not even break uh, the surface of the soil, but the, the kernel did swell and that's all that was needed. Now, interestingly enough, I didn't put any pictures in here, but this year was the third year in a row I've gotten barley to survive the winter. I've, uh, I just, I wanna get more diversity in my fall seeded cereals. And of course we have winter rye, cereal rye will overwinter, uh, winter triticale will overwinter, uh, winter wheat will overwinter, but they have winter barley down south. And I thought, why can't I do that here? So now I'm developing a variety. I've had it three years over winter and it's doing very well. So what I'm doing is I'm planting cereal rye, winter triticale, forage winter wheat, winter barley, hairy vetch, yellow blossom sweet clover. I'm up to six species now that I can plant in the fall and get them to overwinter. Now I'm finally getting enough diversity. Remember that Tillman chart, plant biomass, species diversity? That's what we're trying to do. And uh, we combined it again this year and it did very well, even as dry as we are. John says, where can, or asks, where can I find more information so I can get a better understanding of how to judge or determine the carbon to nitrogen ratio in a field? Yeah, and, and there's a lot of good information online. If you just Google carbon nitrogen ratio, SARE, the group SARE, S-A-R-E, has some good information out there. You can go on our website, understandingag.com, and we have a, a lot of information available. Um, you can inquire to Kathy at understandingag.com, and she will uh, make sure that we get some information to you on that. Mary says, we are newly owners of a ranch in Oklahoma. The pastures we have are loaded with weeds. Would you start with weed control and then work with a local seed company to no-till drill in feed for our seven cows? Would you fertilize? The ground has just been sitting for a few years and you are so right. It is such a scary process just to get started. Thank you, sir. Yes. So I don't believe it. My thought is if an animal will eat it, it's not a weed, it's a forage. So I can show you picture after picture after picture. I literally have not found a single plant on our ranch and we've documented well over 140 different species of plants on our ranch that our livestock will not consume. Now I'm not gonna say that they relish them, but they will consume them. Weeds, quote unquote, are forages. If you really watch and observe livestock, many of your livestock will select a weed at a certain time because these weeds are often the highest in nutrient density. Mary, I would not go trying to eliminate those. I would graze them. I would bring livestock on your seven cows, bring them on graze them at densities, let them trample them. Those weeds are actually feeding biology. That's the natural way of protecting the soil. But then you have to allow adequate recovery time. And this is where many people fall short. They don't allow the necessary time in order to get full recovery so that land can start healing. John says, I custom farm for a neighbor. 
He is all about soil health and has been planting covers for the past three years and no-till for approximately 10 years. When planting wheat, the local elevator agronomist wants 14 days of no green in the field. We struggle with how many days between termination of the 12 species cover crop and when the soil health starts to deteriorate. Mm, that's a very good question. And um, yeah, well, I, I would have some words for the agronomist, but Nora <laughs> knows me well. <laughs> uh, in saying that, they just don't understand. They're, they're solely looking at themselves. The agronomist is worried about the quote unquote green bridge, but realize right. as you advance soil health, that green bridge is, is a non-issue. Now, when will it start to deteriorate? It's important to, to know that a, a soil aggregate will only last about four weeks and then it's gonna be consumed by biology and you need to build new ones. So if you absolutely have to wait that two week window and have that lapse, okay, you can live with it. I would try and narrow it up some, if at all possible. But if you get into four weeks during the growing season with nothing growing, you're having major negative ramifications on soil health. Jolene asks, what is an ideal mix and or species for finishing animals? Oh, you're smiling, so I take it I know which <laughs> Jolene it is. Um, there is no ideal mix. And here is why I say that. And I, I alluded it to it just a moment ago. When you really observe animals and their grazing behavior, there are certain species of plants, they only may take one bite a day but that's an important bite to them. It's supplying a photonutrient that that animal needs. And so uh, obviously we can't afford to go out and seed a hundred different species. However, through proper grazing and recovering times, we're gonna get diversity coming into our paddocks. And it's that diversity that really plays an important role. I'm gonna go off subject here a little bit, Nora, and talk about one of the projects we're doing at Understanding Ag is we're working with Dr. Stephen Van Vliet at Duke University, Dr. Fred Provenza, who many of you are aware of, and Dr. Scott Kronberg. And we're using a mass spectrometer to measure these phytonutrients that we can, are found in the animal's meat then. And Dr. Van Vliet is able to measure over 2,300 different phytonutrients. And it's absolutely amazing what we're seeing uh, when animals have the ability to choose multi-species, how many more phytonutrients they have then in their meat. And that's shown us that these plants, all these species, that's why I don't consider it weeds, they're, they're forbs, and the animals will select for them because of this wide variety of phytonutrients that are needed. You know, uh, the COVID pandemic, as bad as, as it is, is really bringing to light just how weak the human immune systems are. Uh, there was, was uh, some data released just yesterday that only 6% of the deaths in the United States were truly caused by COVID. In other words, 94% of those people that succumbed to this disease had underlying health conditions. In other words, they had weakened immune systems. This goes back directly then to a lack of these phytonutrients in the foods that we're consuming. So our goal at Understanding Ag and working with, with these doctors is how do we measure the food that's produced in healthy regenerative soils? And we're looking at the difference between that and food that's produced on conventional farms and ranches. And I will tell you that the data, it's just overwhelming that the healthier we get the soil, the healthier the food that's gonna be produced. And this current pandemic is really 
driving this home to consumers. They're really starting to source where their food comes from. And I encourage everyone listening, take advantage of that. That's a marketing opportunity for us. You know, if you're moving down the regenerative path and producing these foods higher in nutrient density, let's take advantage of that and put more dollars in our pocketbook because of it, because we deserve it for doing what we're doing. And I think this is our final question. I'm just going to look here. Oh, no, we have one more. But Bob asks, are daily moves for finishing animals sufficient? Are daily moves for finishing animals sufficient? Um, yes, realize you will get increased gains from moving more often. However, in saying that, like at right now, we're moving our finishers once a day. And here's the reason. With finishing animals, you want to allow them the ability to select. So we're only taking about 20% of the above ground biomass. We're letting them have the very cream of the crop, so to speak. And because that, we're giving them a larger area you can get by. Now you will increase average daily gains by moving more often. So you've got to weigh that factor into account also. Okay. I just have to ask, do you have um, another class of livestock come cattle come in behind that or livestock or Maybe, not? yeah behind the grass finishers mm -hmm. is is always poultry when okay. whenever possible we'll bring poultry in we do not uh excuse me bring sheep or or stocker cattle in uh right away what we more often do is because the finishers the grass finishing beef are only consuming 20 percent if we get moisture and it's a ways till frost, uh, that'll regrow. And then we may come back in during the winter and graze that with cow-calf pairs. Okay. And actually that is, I don't have any more questions for you, Gabe. I guess you answered them all. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Nora. It was a real pleasure joining oh, you this evening. Just a minute. Okay. Sorry, I just I just about missed the, this one. Uh, Robert, with your grazing program, are you able to eliminate a salt and mineral program for the cattle? And have you eliminated a vaccination program with your cattle? If so, uh, how many years did it take you to transition to that point? Yes, Robert, very good question. And the answer on all counts is yes. Um, realize that Gabe is a very, very slow learner. It took me a lot of years. Had I known then what I know now, I could have moved down this path much quicker. I cannot tell you how long it would take you. That's a direct function of you and the practices that you employ on your operation. We have now not used a vaccine for 11 years. We haven't used any vaccines or wormers. Um, we have not used any salt or mineral for, I believe this is year six or seven. And the thing about it is, and Nora and I talked about this a little earlier today, is uh, we really, really challenge our livestock. And I think I'm about as hard on our livestock as anyone is because I tell people they just haven't been broke enough. You know, my wife and I were so broke going through our, our lean years, if you can ever believe that I was lean, but uh, um, that, that I just learned that I don't want to spend money. And what I saw is when we do these things, add these crutches, so to speak, we're really only propping up the bottom 10 or 20% of our herd. Why not just get rid of that 10 or 20%? Why, why do all these things just to prop up the bottom end? You know, let them go to McDonald's or wherever, you know, where, whatever you want to do with them. But I don't want unprofitable livestock on my farm or ranch. You know, this isn't a hobby, it's a business, plain and simple. One more question, and then I think we'll wrap it up. Jerry says, here in Wisconsin, after chopping our corn silage, the quicker we plant a cover, the better the soil is to accept the no-tilling. Does this prove the soil is more active versus planting the cover in a two-week period later? I, I think what it proves, Jerry, is the importance of armor on the soil. Because when you're chopping silage, you're removing all that biomass and... Um, 
so that soil is more prone to drying out, to evaporation, to, to, to the heat from the sun, and realize that bare soil, it's not uncommon for bare soil. If, you're, if your air temperature outside is near 90 degrees, you probably have bare soil approaching 140 or 50 degrees. That's very, very detrimental. You will kill soil biology at that in the top two to three inches. So I think it's more indicative of the bare soil than anything else. Okay. Well, Gabe, if people have more questions for you, they can contact you through the website or what? Yeah, they can certainly just, uh, we tell everyone, Kathy is the glue that holds Understanding Ag together. Just email Kathy at understandingag.com and she will get your questions or, or that to us. Awesome. Thanks, Gabe, for a wonderful webinar and answering everybody's questions. It, we really enjoyed it. So thanks again and see you next summer. Thank you, Nora. Look forward to coming to Canada. All right. Bye now.